All right, gangsters. <laughs> Who's ready? Who's ready for the best show of the summer? I'm fired up today. We have so much cool stuff to get into. I want to start by reintroducing you. My name is Downtown Josh Brown. If you're watching this for the first time, uh, my co-host, as always, Michael Batnick. Michael, say hello to the folks. Hello, hello. How about Aloha with that shirt? There we go. Little Aloha. All right. Michael is live from Los Angeles, California. Mm. Big shout out to our clients, Jim and Jane, long ter- longtime clients, uh, for providing a little office space for Mike today. We really appreciate it. Um, let's, let's do some quick shout outs to the crowd. Uh, the Pounders are all here. Chris Hayes, Pam Hill, John Carlo, Roger, Cliff, uh, everybody that you would want to see. Jay Luther is here. Geary is in the house. Uh, I know uh, uh, Roger's here, Shore 51, got Nicole in the chat, uh, Rob's running around in the chat, uh, John and Duncan are in the background controlling all of the elements of the show. Welcome to What Are Your Thoughts? Michael, who's our sponsor tonight? That looks familiar. It is Future Proof. Oh, wow. Great idea. Let's, let's tell the folks about uh, what Future Proof is in a nutshell. Future Proof is Coachella, which I've never been to, for wealth management. Is that a fair comp? <sighs> yeah, I, don't know. I think it works. What? Sure. It's a festival. No, I it's think a that's festival. I tell people South By just because okay. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, that's better. That's better. It's like South By is like a mix of like business and, and art and culture and music. I feel like that's what we do. It's probably a so, little more on the nose. I know you want to talk about the, the FinTech demo, but before we do that, did you know so if you're in the financial services industry and you want to go to Future Proof, but you're not like, you don't really want to buy a ticket. It's a little bit, it's a little bit pricey to, to get there and, and such. If you agree to do something called Breakthrough, which it, you will have to commit to eight 15-minute sessions with an asset manager, a fintech provider, eight 15-minute sessions. Your ticket meetings. Will be co- meetings. 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 Your ticket will be comped mm. and, and... You will get a seven hundred fifty dollars stipend to your travel. That's I mean, that's amazing. a hell of a deal. It's a hell of a deal. You know why that's so important for like young financial advisors or young people working in asset management or fintech? Maybe the firm they work for isn't willing to pay, um, but they want to go. This is a, a great way for us to ensure that you know we're getting young people early in their careers. And putting them in a position, we're supposed to just say something about the uh, the fintech demo. Do you want me to do it quickly? It's seven by seven. Take it. All right, fintech demo drop. So here's what this is: we're looking for fintech innovators to show off the newest and most innovative technology platforms and tools. We're going to select seven fintech companies. They will get seven minutes each to be in the spotlight in front of the crowd, show off what they've built. And they'll be talking to the fastest growing financial advisory firms in America. It doesn't matter if you're early stage or a late stage growth company. This is your opportunity. There's a link in the description to apply. Um, and seven minute abs. Seven minutes in heaven. And uh, futureproof.advisorcircle.com is where you go for general information. Okay, that's enough with the uh, that's enough with the plugs. Uh, I want to talk about something that we probably haven't gotten into in a while, uh, which is fund flows. And I think, I think this is probably the biggest news of the last week is that we are now seeing substantial money flow into the stock market. It's not that surprising given what performance has been, and that's just how it always works. But let's just go through this. Ari Wald, one of my favorite technicians in America, um, he did a piece about fund flows, and he sees fund flows from here forward as fueling the next leg of the rally. Um, a lot of people look at fund flows and they think it's a contrarian signal, but that's not actually how it works. So let me get into this. Um, in their latest weekly release, ICI reported $22 billion estimated net inflow into domestic equity mutual funds and ETFs for the week ending June 16th. That is the highest week since February 2022. Um, On the surface, this can be viewed as a contrarian concern. Digging deeper, this surge in allocated capital was preceded by the most net redemption since November 2020, based on a rolling quarterly total. This was the sixth time since 2013 that at least $19 billion inflows developed, 
following net redemptions over the prior 13 weeks. Those other episodes um, were all the start of, of, a, of a bull market and not the end. November 2016, June 2017, March 2018, November 2020, February 2021. Well, that, that time it didn't work out so well. Uh, mm-hmm. But, but I, I think just this idea that, oh, retail is buying ETFs, all of a sudden that's like something that you want to bet against. The history does not bear that out. It's not that great of an idea to fade. What are your thoughts? We were talking about this with Mark Noonan last week. People using the AAII survey for investors getting bullish after being bearish forever as yeah. a topping signal don't know how this works. It's not that simple. You have to give it time. So chart back on, please. This is, thank you, John. Look at all of the outflows. Investors are capitulating to the upside. Instead of throwing in the towel, like get me out, it's, all right, fine, I guess I got to chase. So when you see flows that are positive, 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 and then there's like a blow off top, fine, then you can get cautious. We're right. in the early stages of people getting, like chasing, not the end. So it doesn't mean that you can't see a pullback or that, you know, that the stocks have to go up 20% from here, but people are just getting bullish. We have data later in the show. After a first six months, that's super positive, coming off a negative year. History says that, you know, stocks are going to be okay. So Stay we'll with it. In other words, you don't see a week of inflows like that. And then a week later, everybody says, ah, forget it. It's just not, that's not right. how the mindset right. of the investor works. It's right. It's too soon to, to try to quote unquote fade retail. Um, this is arguably even more important. What I'm about to get into the, the word on the street over the last week or so is overbought. This is like what you always hear after a rally has gotten going and you see a lot of stocks that are very far above their 200 day or having a, a high relative strength. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, the market's a little overbought. And I think people say that for two reasons. One, they believe it. But two, they kind of missed out and they want to buy. They just don't want to be the ones that buy the top. So it's almost like wishful thinking saying it's overbought implies there's going to be a sell-off and that's going to let them in. This is, this is back to Ari. Let's, uh, John, let's do this first chart while I'm talking. Legendary, uh, what do I want to say? No, I'm not going to start there. All right, this is Ari Wald. The best returns have surprisingly occurred when the index is deeply oversold. This is S&P 500 returns uh, greater than down 10% below the 200-day moving average. However, the index has also posted above average returns when trading greater than 10% above its 200-day moving average, um, as is currently the case. This reflects the trend-following tendencies of large-cap stocks. The S&P has posted its poorest returns when the trend is down below its 200-day moving average and not yet deeply oversold. Overall, right. we reiterate S&P 500 upside into 4,600. We'll be watching the index's ability to uphold 4,300, which was the August 22 peak um, during this initial pause. We believe tactical conditions become increasingly attractive towards 4,200. So what they were showing in that chart, real quick, back, throw that back up. So you're looking at the S&P 500 as of the end of last week, more than 10% above the 200-day moving average. That's in the bottom pane. And what Ari is showing you here in this table is what forward returns are when we get to um, what some would say is overbought. But an S&P that's above its 200-day moving average by 10% or greater actually uh, the 12-month average forward returns are 11.1%, which are the second best. Uh, the second best on this whole table. So I think it's really important not just to think in terms of overbought as an automatic sell signal. Michael, you have any thoughts on that? This is <clears throat> this is not unusual or a rare occurrence. Chart off. It's happened. It's happened 18% of the time that you're more than 10% above the sta- uh, above the 200-day moving average, and we keep saying this. How can an overwhelming demand for stocks be bearish? Like, how is that yeah. a bad people? Because people say overbought as if it's a bad thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Stocks can consolidate, you know. But the best markets don't wait for you. They don't let you in. Just because you say it's overbought doesn't mean you're going to get a better entry. And I'm not saying I'm not saying go nuts and throw caution to the wind and start chasing. I'm just saying the best markets don't usually don't let you in. So. I've got a few trust you, Josh. Well, wait, I got, uh, one, I got one more on this before we move yeah. on. Last, I'm sorry. Last one from Ari. 
the momentum effect is even stronger in the NASDAQ 100. So everything I just told you about the S&P, you can double that. Market, wow. this is back to Ari. Market bears have specifically pointed to the, the Q's current 23% deviation above the 200 day as an indication of froth. However, yeah, that's froth, that's froth. But wait, since yep. 1986, the NASDAQ has posted its best six to 12 month returns when already trading at least 20% above its 200 day moving average. That's an indication that price momentum has been especially effective in the benchmark. Recent action also marked only the fourth time in the index's 200 day deviation uh, swung from negative 20 to plus 20% within a year. You know what else Wild. that happened? March 91, bottom. September 03, bottom. July 09, bottom. Rather than an indication of froth, we believe this study supports our view that the NASDAQ's long-term advance is resuming. Chart back on real quick. I want to do this table. So look Let's at this. A- NASDAQ 200-day o- over 20% um, or, or, or 20% above its 200-day. The average 12-month return back to 1986 has been almost 25%, which I never would have guessed that. Um, so if you think the momentum in the S&P is strong, the NASDAQ yeah. is, is even more so. All, All right, right so to my, to my point about stocks not letting you in, this is from Deutsche Bank. We're now in the 85th percentile of period since World War II without a 3% drawdown in the S&P 500. It's been 73 trading days and over three months in real life, which is, which is kind of mind-blowing. When you th- John, chart off, please. I saw a great staff in Bespoke um, that today was, or yesterday was the fifth day in a row that the S&P 500 opened negative with a gap mm. down. So even despite that, they're like tiny gaps. And guess what? They're getting bought, right? So it's been a long time. The market doesn't let you in. And the next chart shows the NASDAQ's overbought conditions. It's been 34 straight days with one standard deviation or more above the 50-day moving average. This is from Bespoke. Again, not to say that we can't get a pullback. Is this, it's overbought, just, wait, is this overbought since February? Since, uh, yeah. I, I just I can't reiterate this strongly enough. Je- with the, as a general rule... The strongest markets don't let you in. Uh, it's so crazy, though, how hard this is if you're paying any attention to anything other than price. Right. I, feel like, I feel like everything away from price um, is telling you maybe not that stocks need to go down, but like is telling you there's absolutely no fundamental basis for them going higher. Like You are hearing some great news from individual companies, but I'm talking about the economy at large. It's just such a stark difference between, uh, or maybe maybe that's getting better too. Um, at, at least a, a, as of a month ago, it's tough. All right, let's keep let's keep it moving. Uh, Stick with the stock market. We asked our audience, where will the market end this year? And this was a week ago, higher or lower? Uh, and there you go, kind of kind of dead even actually, not kind of dead even. Fifty. Oh, this is update. It, Oh, look at this. That's so interesting. It's so it, it was 51% up, 49% down. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Now it's 56.44. Human behavior, <laughs> we chase. We chase. You I know chase. What this reminds me of the, the up from here went from 51% to 56% over the course of a week. It, it reminds me of like the line with, uh, with like uh, the Kansas City Chiefs about to play Monday Night Football. And everyone comes to their senses. They're like, wait a minute. It's Mahomes. Like, what? <laughs> and then you see, like, the, the bet shift. Like, of, of course, of course they're going to cover. Of course they're going to win. So that, that's interesting how it's, it's moved that way. Um, but it's, I think it's just following price. I don't, think, uh, I don't think, like, there's no news that you would point to that would tell you why all of a sudden people feel better three or four days later. Right. No, it's price. So, uh, all right. This is price. from Dietrich. You're looking at there's about eight times when the S&P 500 is up more than 10 percent through June, mm. and when it was pr- it was it w- the S&P was negative in the previous year, the forward returns have been remarkably strong. And all that we're saying is again, you have a down year, and then in the next year, those years June, on the left are all years where the market finished lower. Is that uh, what we're saying? 
Uh, oh, the, no, or no, the no. next year. These are the year no. later. So, so 1953, for example, the market was yeah, down yeah, six got points. It. Okay. Got it. So if the market is down one year and then the next year it's up 10% through June, the forward returns have been phenomenally well. Phenomenally well. Uh, so, Ryan, Ryan Dietrich, among the most requested guests for the Compound and Friends. Like, that's the name that keeps coming up. Like, why don't you guys have Ryan Dietrich on? Right. He's coming. He's coming. And then, yeah, I spoke to Ryan. He'll, he'll get a chance to come to New York. And okay. then... And then just if you take out the, the negative the year before, if you just say, okay, for all years, no, no other caveats. When the S&P is up 10% through the end of June, what is the average return for the next six months and the next 12 months? It's 8% average uh, six months later, 12% on average higher 12 months later with a higher return, 82 and 77% of the time respectively. I'm focused so strength, on strength begets strength. I'm focused on the six month column. So, because basically what we're saying is like uh, the first half of the year. And then second half. So, right. So, the next six months would represent how the year finishes. Right. And it looks like only once in 1975 uh, did you actually have a decline by year end over, over a year uh, plus 10% through June. This is not, this is not, that's not, that 5.3% is not a decline through year end. It's how did it do for the next six months? Yeah, but that would be technically year end because the first six months ends in June. My point is it doesn't mean that the market was down 5.3% for the year. That's all I'm saying. No, I, right. Okay. That, you're right. That's, yeah. that's, I, I was just, I was thinking about the full year. Okay. Yeah. So that's just what happened six months later. So it's not necessarily the full year return. Now all of okay. the all of the all of these data points you have to take with a grain of salt because past performance is obviously no guarantee. However, I take shit like this seriously because what's so funny? Who's laughing? You okay, have a voice you in are. your head? I take shit like this seriously. Why? Because well, now these, you're making it funny. <laughs> these data points are behavioral data points, okay? Yeah. Because what you're saying is what happens when the market was really bad and then it did really well. And then what happened to the rest of the year? So economics, data points, all that shit aside, human behavior is consistent. It really is. Yeah. And as we say all the time on this show and elsewhere, um, that's really what you're buying. Like in the end, the stock price that you receive at some point in the future is a result of what all the buyers and sellers think about it. Like that's, that's it. That's what you're investing. You're investing in other people's perception of your investments. Like, there's no way around that. You can't, there's nothing else determining price. So that's a really good so, point that you make. W when I see, when I th see things like this, I take it seriously. It's not informing, I'm not making uh, binary decisions or going all in or out, but I respect the data. There, I respect Fair. data. Next topic. Uh, so here's the gray lining to the silver cloud. The, the, the chimpanzees are back. Uh, options market euphoria. Uh, trading activity has more than doubled since the start of the year, according to the CBOE Global Markets. Uh, Wall Street Journal did a story called, I, just, I, I picked out the title because this is one of those things that you look back at and you say, oh shit, I should have seen this. The bull market is just getting started, traders bet. Subheader, euphoria sweeps the market for stock options. Chart back on? Like, that's not great. Nah. I don't love this. We're outdoing, we're outdoing the, 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 the mania from 2020 and 2021. Uh, let me read this. Bullish bets on artificial intelligence. Chart off, please. Bullish bets on artificial intelligence have boomed. More than 1.3 million call contracts on chip makers NVIDIA and advanced micro devices. Next chart back on. Changed hands on an average day in June. On track for the highest monthly total on record. Those volumes surpassed the exuberance seen in November 2021 when the NASDAQ composite reached its peak. Trading activity has more than doubled since the start of the year. So this is, we're looking at uh, chip stocks, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, et cetera. Uh, this is what's going on in the call options for those stocks. I don't love it. I don't know. What no. are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I don't love seeing euphoria in individual names. That usually doesn't end well, right? I mean, we've seen this, we've seen this movie before. I think it's extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult to time it. A friend of mine, two or three weeks ago, bought NVIDIA uh -oh. put options. Uh -oh, and dude. I'm like, I'm like, dude, it's way, you're way too early. Like we wait. And they were expiring in July. I'm like, if you want to buy put options, which I totally respect. And I understand that inclination that this, you know, give it like, 
six months? Like, you think that you're going to, like, nail the top just because people are, are bullish? Okay. I have the opposite friend as you. So this is a true story. When I lived in the Upper East Side a million years ago, uh, I knew a guy, and I stopped being friends with him um, because one time we went to walk our babies in the strollers, and he was pushing a stroller with an infant. I had my infant. He was pushing his own with a, with a blunt, like a lit blunt, like okay. pushing wow. a baby stroller through, like, city streets, not in a park, literally hitting a blunt. And, like, I'm not, I'm not a prude. Like, I'm okay. Yeah, you I'm okay. Get 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 high, you, get you, get, you can get arrested for that. Back then you could. But it was just, like, the idea that somebody would want to do those two things simultaneously. And I, I'm a new first-time father. So I'm, like, <laughs> overprotective. I just – I don't want this guy blowing a blunt, blunt smoke within five feet of, of my kid sitting in a stroller. So I never hung out with him again. And I kid you not, it's probably two or three weeks ago, I got, I got a text. It was, like, yo, cuz – um, this guy's a lawyer, by the way. Uh, yo, cuz, I don't really buy individual stocks, but you think it's too late on NVIDIA? And I'm just like, so you don't buy stocks, but the first thing that you want to do is step into the market and buy a stock that just went up 3,000%. Yeah. So I, I, here's, I wrote to him, I wrote to him, I don't know, LOL, with like a crazy face emoji. What I really wanted to say is, why don't you just go back to taking care of your kids with a blunt in your hand like the fucking animal you are and leave NVIDIA to the professionals. You don't I need don't to judge. Involved. We don't judge. We don't judge. No, no I, I think, literally <laughs> judge. I no, but literally I think this, judge. This, this is a good point. People underestimate like how crazy shit is. Like, oh, this has to end badly. And yeah, maybe, probably, probably, but not yet. Like there are so many donkeys like that guy that are buying NVIDIA every single day. Yeah, and it'll, it'll, um, it'll fade in. I wrote this. Uh, I just feel, I feel like where does momentum come from? It's not a force of nature per se. It's it's to your point. It's behavior. I think momentum is fueled by the recency bias. I think the more a stock rises, for the most part, the more confident the market becomes that it will continue to rise. I think like perceived safety in the eyes of the other investors and the people that are in it starts to go up. And I was thinking about this in terms of like biology or evolution. You think about like if you're a penguin and you see all the penguins swimming in one specific area, like you come along and you're like, all right, all the penguins are there. There's probably a lot of fish. There's probably not a shark or a seal eating them. Like that's That's probably what I should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean with obviously with exceptions, when something does like what GameStop did, I think most people know that's not more safety. Um, but chip stocks, I think, is an example where people are just like, yeah, that's where the money's being made right but now. But wait, Josh, it's one more thing. It's, it's, when it's when you combine the price action with the story of AI and a new paradigm, that's when things get really stupid. Would, I would, would you be surprised if NVIDIA's up 60% in the next six months? I wouldn't. When you I think mean, it's I, dumb, it gets, it gets dumber. I would be surprised, but it probably – I don't know. <laughs> I don't, dude, I have no opinions anymore about that. All right, let's keep moving. You got something? Oh. Uh, we're going to talk about the Fed and what their next move is. All right. Today's show is brought to you by Bespoke. Thank you for this data from Bespoke. (laughs) All right. For those expecting the Fed to go on an extended pause, here's how long prior pauses after tightening cycles have lasted since 1994. 15 months was the longest. But what's interesting is, and I don't know what the data says going back prior to this, but... They've never, at least since 94, they've never paused and then resumed hikes. Mm, that's interesting. They, well, they've reversed, though. Like, well, every time. They, every time. When, you, when they pause, they've, they've taken rates down. Okay, but that's just in the very recent history. I'm sure there are examples where they have. Uh, but I guess it's like 30 years worth of data. How much more do you really want? Yeah, it's, all, it's, it's rare. Not. I guess the, the point is it's very rare for them to pause and then say we haven't done enough. Is that, is that what we're saying? It hasn't happened. So you know. Now they, 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 no, yes. They have not reversed. Now, they reversed course from 93. They cut. They paused. They cut. They paused. And they started raising rates into the dot-com bubble. But when they pause, generally they cut. So do you think, do you think the next move from the Fed is another hike or cutting? Because I... I would, given how strong the economy still is, if I had to bet, I would say the next move is another hike. No, I don't have to, but that's what I would bet on. 
Uh, I think the market is pricing that in as a 79% chance as of today, the last data I saw, that, that the next move is a hike. So I don't know. The market seems to think that's pretty likely. But that well, could change. One, you know, that let could me change. ask you one, one follow-up question to this. How impactful for the market is the next Fed move? So I don't mean the next pause. How impactful or I think more likely are they going to be behind the curve where they're going to be panic cutting or raising rates because the economy keeps going higher? You know, that was a very popular view that by year end they would be forced to cut. And I might have entertained that, you know, at some that point was in the earlier data. this year. That was in the data. Everyone that was that. in the data. And, and that was a very popular view. And, you know, even I remember saying like, you know, all right, do another two hikes if you feel you need to. But those are the first two you're giving back. Um, maybe not this year, though, is, is, is at, at least what the market is now seeming to price in. Like, yeah, maybe they will have to cut, but not, not an emergency, not like right this second. I don't know. This, the, the biggest train wreck in the economy right now is commercial real estate, but it's very slow moving train wreck. It doesn't feel like it's the kind of thing that's just one day going to explode into like a VIX spike and everyone panicking. It's a well, very this? slow motion crash. That is true. And what's also true, I would ask you, do you think that the commercial real estate market can take on the global economy? Yeah, I know it can, but it probably won't because no, everyone's don't. expecting it to. No, you don't. You don't no, know anything. for a fact that it could. You don't know anything. I know for a fact that it could. I know if the residential real estate market could in 2008, the commercial guys are more overlevered than a typical homeowner and their links into the banks are even scarier uh, than, than re like a regular mortgage bond. So, yeah, I know it could. I don't think it will. Um, and I think wow. there's so much. What a there's... bullshit answer. What a nonsensical answer. You know Why? it can. Of you know it, it can. You know it can, but it's not going to. Give me a break. I don't think it will because I think a lot of attention is already focused there. And people are already talking about it like a buying opportunity. So I just don't think it's going to rise to that level. But could it? Yeah, of course it could. Why couldn't it? Riddle me that. Why, could, why couldn't it take down the global no, economy not, if no, left I'm unchecked? Not, no, there's a big difference. I'm not saying it can't. But oh, you... What are we fighting about? But you are saying, I know it can. And I'll tell you I one thing, I do know thing, it sir. can. You don't know, and you don't know shit about fuck. How about that? I do know it can, though. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Move on, let's move on. Uh, agree that I'm right. All right. Uh, <laughs> wait, what's this other, what's this other uh, fact nah, it's the same you thing. It's, a, it's the same thing. Okay, great. It's enough. Uh, here's why it won't. Um, uh, people have too much money. I want to play this for you, John. Oh, audio. Mm. I oh, think I the second quarter is going to be our highest Q2 earnings in our history, coming just three years after the start of the pandemic, which is pretty incredible. And the other data point that we'll be sharing today is that we're putting a new marker out there to generate $10 billion of free cash between now and 25 as a result of the continued strength, because we think we're in a multi-year recovery. You think this continues for some period Absolutely. of time? There, there's, there's no signs of any let up. And I'll give you a couple of data points. In our industry, 75% of the revenues, we all talk about the consumer and the health of the consumer and wondering about cracks in the consumer. And we get that. 75% of our revenues come from consumers that are in the top 40% of earnings. Households making $100,000 or more make up 75% of our revenue base. As an industry, Delta arguably is even higher than that. The wealth that that cohort has accumulated just since 2019 is over $25 trillion. They have the wealth. And the, we talk about excess savings in terms of incremental cash savings. That number is still well over a trillion dollars for that cohort. So, so that's very strong. All right. Thanks, John. So that was the CEO of Delta. They came out this morning. They said $2 billion in profit. How about $3 billion? They raised guidance for Q2. They raised 24. They raised 25. Here's some notes from Sean. All five S&P 500 airlines are now above their 50 and 200-day moving average. Two airlines made 52-week highs today, Delta and United. Uh, the median forward PE for the five airlines is six times earnings. Median earnings per share growth for next year is 16%. Um, Delta had their investor day. They said they expect earnings per share to come in at two and a quarter to two fifty a share. Previously expected two dollars to two and a quarter. Uh, they think this quarter will be the highest in company history. 
uh, three billion in free cash flow, which is 50% above the previous estimate. Um, and of course, these companies not only have insatiable demand and rationalized cost structures, um, no profit, no unprofitable flights, etc. They also have jet fuel prices that are down 30% year over year. So it's it's a trade that I definitely missed. Uh, these stocks look incredible. I think Delta is up 40% in a month. Um, and if you look at any of the other charts, they look pretty good. Uh, what happened? The cops bust in? No, I'm hot. Just put it on the air. Keep going. Oh, all right. No, I'm, I'm done. What are your thoughts? All right. So I, uh, I'm mad that I missed Delta. Although I'm, 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 I'm not mad. The, the chart didn't let me in. Like, it was not looking good. I was I've, I've, been, I've been stalking Delta. Stalking. Oh, like you a have? Tiger. I've, yeah, I've been wanting to buy. You fly the, Delta. You actually like Delta. I exclusively fly Delta. And I've been looking. And just it, the chart looked like junk. And then all of a sudden, it broke out and it doesn't let you in. It's up like 14 in the last 16 days. I'm making that up. That's directionally right. Mm. Um, so it didn't let you in. Fine. That's how, you know, sometimes that's how it works. The, the audience fly, thinks you're hitting a blunt. I just want to point. I know you're not. But like, excuse me? There's, a lot of, there's a lot of chat about what you're, what you're busy doing with windows and whatnot. Why would I be hitting a blunt? <laughs> I'm just looking at the live chat. The audience thinks there are blunts involved. There's blunt activity. All right, listen, I, I've been known to, but not not right now. Okay, so uh, I can't believe how busy the airports still are. I really thought the travel boom was going to be short lived. Like probably like same. I got this coming, wrong. Coming out of the pandemic, I was extremely wrong. I said, listen. Yeah, I get it. I'm pent up too. I'm going to do a trip, but I didn't think that people would do like another trip and another trip. And four more trips. They keep, they keep tripping. So the airport was crowded as hell. I tried to upgrade my flight. Couldn't do it. Uh, not an empty seat in the house. Please, now, I, now tell me what's going on. What's going on in the chat? On the money said, he's definitely hitting a blunt. That's what a blunt smoker would say. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's not hitting blunts. Guys, the, the big thing here is that I was saying in 2022, all right, everyone will get it out of their system. This is a phenomenon that is not stopping. No. That was very wrong. And no. what the guy from Delta is basically telling you is that it's just endless demand for business travel, vacation travel, any kind of travel. As far as the eye could see, the people who travel are the people who have all the excess savings and they still have it. Guess what? There's no incentive for this dude to raise guidance. Like, that's not no, the game that CEOs nuts. are used to playing. And also, the stock is, I think, still like 30-something percent off of its high. It's not going to let you in. You're not getting a pullback. I'm not going to chase airline stocks. I'm not buying, I, I'm not buying it either. Yeah, I missed it. Not, there's not enough, blunts in the, there's not enough blunts in the world for me to buy an, an airplane rally. It's just no, – I just can't do it. By the way, uh, I, I, I said it. this – This is a nice segue into luxury. Although, I said this last week on the show, and I said it again to Ben today – because I've, I've been on fire lately catching bottoms with stocks. However, <laughs> no, listen, this is not a brag. It's the opposite. It only works in bull markets. What are you laughing okay. at? Okay, nothing. It only, it only works Same in more. bull markets. Only, it only works in bull markets. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, no well, shit, no, I know. Of course, because if it's not a bull market, then they roll right over as soon as you yes, buy them. Yes, yes. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, I'm yeah. a genius. This shit only works because the stock market is going up. Yes, Duh. I agree. Okay. The, the type of behavior that you're exhibiting is not the type of behavior that benefits you in any other type of environment than right now. Correct. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, but okay. there's a huge, but there's a huge catch up trade underway. And the airlines are just the latest example of a broader phenomenon, which begs the question, what's next? What's the next catch up? I'll trade? tell you it's dollar general. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Um, all right. I, I think I, I think energy, but okay. Okay, but this is the opposite of the dollar. Into that. This is the this is the opposite of Dollar General. Let's talk about luxury. Josh, last week I made the case for Dollar General, and you, understandably not hating, said I just I'd rather buy luxury. You're a snob, and I totally respect that. So, <laughs> so, so these charts are from quarter uh, luxury. Look at this chart. Luxury is a very large and resilient industry. This is personal luxury goods market in billions, and it's I don't online know and offline is the gray and black. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, you think this is slowing down or is there going to be a pullback here? There's no pullback coming. There's no pullback. Not only People is it just, not slowing down, it's international. It's all over the world syn on a synchronized basis. It's just everywhere. So look at the next chart. Global premium market for handbags. Mm. Uh, what's, why is footwear on here? That's weird. Is there, are there bags for your feet? Uh, no, it's most footwear. of the let – me, let me solve that mystery, Scooby. Please. 
most of the premier designers of luxury handbags, they're in the leather business, so they also make shoes. Okay. I mean, look at this chart. Would you sell this chart? I wouldn't. No. No. And actually, the one that really got away from me is not Delta or whatever. It's LVMH. Yeah. I should have been buying this thing in the middle of the pandemic, just understanding human nature and watching my wife and her friends. They didn't slow down for a second. Like, you know, they took a beat like everyone else. And then when a nuclear holocaust didn't envelop the earth, like everyone else, they went back and said, all right, what will make me feel better? What can I buy today? That's how humans are. Like, that's how people are. So uh, LVMH owns every major luxury brand other than Gucci and a couple of others, which are owned by a company called Kering. But, you know, that, that chart doesn't look as good as LVMH, but... The guy running LVMH is now the richest man in the world. I think him and Elon seesaw every, every few months. Well, um, there you go. It's not an accident. It's the best business there is. John, please skip the next chart and go to the one after it. Perfect. Thank you. So beauty is resilient to economic uncertainty. The only time this chart went down was when we were all stuck at home. And that's the only time it will go down. This, what you're looking at is a chart. It says L'Oreal beauty market estimates based on manufacturers' net prices excluding soap, toothpaste, razors, and blades. So this is like actual stuff that people, you know, make up and all that sort of shit. It's, it's going up. It's Estee Doesn't Lauder. Stop. It's Ulta. It's Sephora. It's, it's, it's just an endless. And, and it's, look, it like snapped after that down 8% year. Then they had the best year in history right afterward. Like it snapped back with a vengeance. And um, yeah, I so, mean, that's, it's not going to stop ever. So I respect I your stance on buying, uh, buying, you know, growth, not value. However, shout out to no, it's not, one can more, I one more time. time. It's not growth versus value. What it is is margins versus a knife fight at the bottom of the barrel. Dollar respect. general, dollar general versus Dollar Tree versus a flea market is a shitty business, even if you win. LVMH is like 40, 50% margins. It's unbelievable. There's almost no other business that good on earth other than maybe Apple and Microsoft. And they never discount. If they discount, they're dumping stuff on TJ Maxx. And they're doing so in such small amounts because if they did it a lot, they would do what Coach did a generation ago and crush the cachet of the brand. So they make a limited number of pieces. They sell every one of them at a huge markup at retail. They get a full margin, and it's the demand just never goes away. It's if an amazing is, business. If there's excess luxury goods, they put it in a vault like in Blood Diamond. So you're right. Those, the margins are strong. But next chart, please. So this is from Bespoke. Of the 25 worst performers in the Russell 1000 year date through June 15th, okay, Okay. 20, 24 of them. So of the 25 worst performers, 24 of them are down since June 15th. Dollar General is the only name in the green. I rest my case. Two things. Dollar General figured out that they can't actually charge a dollar for anything anymore. So they're reclaiming some price, which is long overdue. A dollar is not a dollar these days. Um, the second thing is I happen to believe that a bigger driver of Dollar General's uh, fundamentals is inflation and not necessarily like, quote unquote, the consumer. And with inflation costs easing and supply chains cooling off and shipping costs easing and like that whole thing, maybe not, decelerate, maybe not decelerating, but at least plateauing, that gives them room to start making money again. And I think that's why that stock is starting to perform. I still don't want it. I still don't want it. All right. Make the we're going to do. Uh, All right. So, so you don't like case. my stock. You're going to make the case for the shittiest stock in the world. Go ahead. I think please. I found it. Go ahead. Ladies and, gen ladies and gentlemen of the compound, I'm pretty sure I found the worst stock on earth. And <laughs> uh, Michael, you like catching bottoms, handsome? Not this Is that one. You, that's, that's your game? Not catch this one. This catch this bottom. Nope. This is Hudson Pacific Properties. You, you know, I have this, uh, this is down 85% since uh, the middle of 2018. Chart off, please. I have this recurring nightmare. I don't really talk about it publicly a lot. I'm falling through the sky, um, not from space, but like just through clouds. And uh, I never land. I'm just screaming and screaming and screaming. And it never ends. And I don't ever hit the ground. There is no ground. The earth is not even rushing up at me and getting larger. I'm just falling. 
We've that's spoken about chart this. back on. Chart back on. That's what that's <laughs> that's what this <laughs> that's what this reminds me of. Um, I don't know where the bottom is, but let me talk so to you a spoken, little bit about. You, you know, you know, there are doctors for this, not for the stock chart, but for your dream nightmare. Go on, yeah, make the, the case, please. The doctors are, are they? They said they said they weren't interested. Uh, total cash and equivalents here through Q1, 163 wow. million dollars left. Let me just stop you right there. You're starting off with cash. That's well, yeah, because it's wow. about survival when you're a sub five dollar. Uh, real estate investment trust. Wow. Hell it's of a, a pitch. It's a game You're of starting survival. off with cash on the balance sheet. Wow. Okay, keep going. 163, which is down from 255 million during the previous quarter. Um, so they're getting toward the low end of, of cash. Uh, 4.5 billion long term debt, 5.3 billion in total liabilities. Uh, last quarter, just to give you some sense of the income here, it's 252 million in revenue, 32 million operating income. Fifty-four million in interest expense. This is a six hundred eighty-three million dollar market Sir, cap. Are you making the short case for the stock? I'm making the case that it's the worst stock on earth, and I'm going to tell you why now. Let me give you the fundamentals. You just did. Go ahead. No, Hudson Pacific recent news flow. Sorry, Hudson Pacific Properties, which, as you could probably guess, is office buildings, but they actually found a way to make it worse. <laughs> They, they diversified into sound stages just in time for the writer's strike. <laughs> so they own 90 sound stages. Um, they, bought, they bought Quixote Studios for $360 million, which owns 23 sound stations and a fleet of film production trucks and cash trailers. Even their side hustle sucks. Uh, this is real estate office portfolio primarily in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and Seattle. Can you come up with four you, worse? No. <laughs> Did you say, is their interest expense larger than their operating income? I think that's what I said, yeah. I forgot so this company's this company's dead. Hold on. Uh, the, <laughs> the office vacancy rate in those four markets, LA, San Fran, Silicon Valley, and Seattle, the office vacancy rate is between 23 and 33%. First of all, which direction that you think that's going? Yeah. It's going higher. Higher. Uh, all right, last thing. The company has lost money since 2020. In the There's last no, all right, 12... it's enough. It's enough. Seriously, it's all enough. All right, anyway. I do, but I do see, I do see buy 30%. Buy or sell. <laughs> buy or sell. <laughs> I see 30 to 40% upside before 100% downside. I do see that. All right, here's what I would say to you. Here's what I would say to you. If, if this stock's going to work, then it's a double off the bottom. Like, yeah. like it's, yeah. it's a okay. double. I think though the odds of where is it right now? Four eighty. Is that what, what? What did I say? Where is it? Put the chart back up real quick. Yeah. So when they break five, I got to be honest with you, I've never seen them come back. Like yeah. financial companies breaking five, because a new thing starts to happen, which is that banks and lenders and partners don't want to do business with you. It almost takes on a. It takes on a. a it's like a vicious cycle. Like we can't fix the company if we don't get loans or blah, blah, blah. Under $5 a share, it's really hard. Maybe they'll do a reverse split. I don't know what the answer is. but it, And I don't mean to laugh at anyone's misfortune. It's just this is like an impossible uh, company in an impossible sector. So this think, is how you know, despite, despite what we said earlier, this is how you know things are a little bit frothy when you're making the case for the worst stock in the world. Um, are you being facetious? Uh, I don't know. All right. I don't know. I, you want to be the best stock in the world? I mean, this this is this is how I feel. All right, you're you're up, mystery chart. We got two for we got two today. One is I'm just going to give it away. Chart on, please. So as you can see, this chart is flat since a major world event. This chart is flat since a major world event. I'm gonna and go you could see you could see it I broke know, out. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oil. Close. Broader. Natural gas? Commodities. Commodities in general. Okay, so yeah. mostly oil? Right, how, how wild is this? So since, since the invasion, uh, all around tripped. This is Primarily the Invesco oil, but... DB commodity tracking ETF, or DBC is the ticker, and it is uh, flat with, what is that? That's like February of 22, right before the, the war? Yep. Um, yeah, listen, a lot of the stuff that goes into this, literally grows on trees. I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. 
like the, the whole thing with like lumber prices. I'm, I'm trying to tell people, literally, it grows. Pretty wild. Is, I mean, this is why the cannabis stocks were never going to work. It, like, li- you could literally grow more. All right. So here, but here's now that was just, that was just the appetizer. Now we're on to the entree. We're going to start with a ten-year look. The purple line is the S and P five hundred. So I guess you could say that this has been a an underperformer. It's down eight yeah. percent over. This is my portfolio. Over uh, the last ten years, this is total return. Uh, this is a storied stock. You know, here's the problem with me, Josh. My clues are too, my clues are too good. This is a storied stock mm-hmm. that has that was removed from the Dow Jones Industrial Average in two thousand eighteen. Next chart, please. That has been on a tear lately. This is the last three years. I know it. Okay, well, the last, well let me just finish. This is the last three years. It's up 162%. The S&P is up 51 And then year to date, this monster of a stock is up 60%. The S&P is up 14 And this stock is? General Electric. Boom shakalaka. Wow. You gave me too much, dude. I know. I'm too good at this. You gave me too much. You're very good at this. You're very good at giving. You're very good at giving clues that you but, know I'm going to guess at. But look at the chart, good mystery of G- chart. That was look good. at the chart of, G- of General Electric. It's, Can we put that back ver- up. It's vertical. Put, this is GE's in purple year to date, up sixty percent versus the S and P up fourteen. Year to date. But what's the what's the longer term? Go back one chart. What's the longer so term? This is ten years. The S and P's up two hundred twenty five percent in ten years. GE is down seven percent. Wow, that's an, that's amazing. And Josh, are you looking at like industrials are on fire? Yeah, industrials uh, on fire. Yeah, and this is like you know what? It's a storied stock. It's had a few incarnations. It's had huge challenges, but in the do you end, you know why it's going it's up? A, it's it's an know, industrial. Do you know any? Is there any reason? I honestly have no idea. Well, they have a really big energy business, which was like an anchor around their neck for a few years, and maybe last year that that improved. Um, they're in aerospace. They're in healthcare. Um, and maybe some of those end markets are uh, returning to normal, and they're getting the benefit of that. Geez, and but look, they're selling. There's a record backlog of planes right now. Any kind of plane you can think of. All of the airlines all over the world are ordering planes. Like Boeing's backlog is bigger than it's ever been, and GE plays a role in that market. You know, they're 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 the the propel the propel the propellant of of a jet plane is what GE does. So uh, I, I think it's a pretty simple story, actually. They're not doing any of the financial engineering, any of the shenanigans with the media company. They're not doing, like, uh, any of the earnings manipulation, at least we don't think. Like, that day and age is over. Now it's an industrial subject to the vicissitudes of demand for their products. That's what it trades on, and demand is coming back. So Josh, before we simple. get out of here, are we off next week? Are we taking off? Yeah, next week's July 4th, everybody. So we wanted to tell you in advance – we will not be here Tuesday, but you guys will be having fun and enjoying the uh, celebration, so you won't miss us too much. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before we go, we're trying something new. Uh, this, the audio from today's show, in case you join late or you want to experience it again, is going to be part of the Compound and Friends podcast. So we're going to start putting that up Tuesday night on the Compound and Friends feed. Um, same old Michael and I. Uh, you'll get us now twice a week rather than once, and we'll see if you guys are into it. We'll see what the reception is, but you can look for that on the uh, Compound and Friends feed later tonight. Tomorrow, all new Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Um, new Ask the Compound with Ben on Thursday, and we end the week with an all-new episode of the Compound and Friends. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much for liking and favoriting and doing all the things. We'll see you soon.